Hello, everybody, and welcome to this first breakout session during the SOSV Climate Tech Summit. Uh, I'm Ben Joff. I'm one of the curators of the summit. And at SOSV, uh, we love to support the ecosystem in climate tech. Uh, we've backed over 100 startups in the field. And uh, as you know, it's a team sport and uh, it's a global imperative actually to work with many other companies such as today Lower Carbon Capital, uh, represented by Shuo Yang, partner at Lower Carbon. And with him is uh, Ben Tauber, uh, founding partner at Velocity. Uh, over to you now, Shuo and Ben. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here this morning. Ben and I are super, super excited to talk to you all. Um, ben, you are really, really good at events like this. So I will let you take the lead now. Oh, thank you, Xiao. Uh, it's great to be here with you and just want to welcome all the participants online. I think you know one of the things that uh, Xiao and I are just so passionate about uh, when we work with entrepreneurs in our, in our various capacities is that, uh, particularly in climate, is that you really are here to have a positive impact on on humanity. What you do matters, right? And, uh, you know, this isn't Instagram for cats or things like that. Right? These are things that are going to make an impact uh, to our lives, to our children's lives. And so just want to honor and thank everyone for, for being here today. And so I want to introduce the topic. I want to introduce us. And then we're going to get into a little bit of uh, concrete discussion, right? So the topic is the most important metric that people don't optimize for, and that's creativity, right? Because the reason this is important is that you're here to solve really hard problems, often problems that we don't know the, the solutions for, right? This isn't stacking bricks and how to do that faster and better. Or maybe for some of you, it is stacking bricks, right? We are in climate, right? So, uh, but we're gonna talk about why this metric is important. We're gonna talk about very concrete and tactical ways that you can apply this tomorrow to accelerate the velocity of your teams so that you can get to the, that next round of funding so you can get to the impact that, that you want to have. So that's why we're here. And um, towards that end, it's my delight and pleasure to, to introduce you uh, to Xiao uh, as a partner at Lower Carbon Capital, previously a partner at 50 Years Ventures and a serial entrepreneur. And one of the things that that I really value about Xiao, along with uh, his wealth of experience as an entrepreneur and investor, is his passion for the founders, passion for seeing them be successful and grow. And that's one of the things that that I've uh, seen and it just has really resonated for me as a as a coach is that he's insanely passionate about you as an individual. And that's the thing that that makes these companies grow is the is the founders uh, and that founder focus. So thank you for being here, Xiao. It's just an honor. I really appreciate the kind words, Ben. And I'd like to return the favor. Uh, I'm really, really happy that Ben agreed to join me on stage today. Ben is not only one of the best coaches I know, but I'm privileged to call him my own personal coach. And I don't think I would be half the person I am today if it wasn't for Ben's tutelage and mentorship over the years. And I think one of the things I really, really appreciate about Ben is that he is a coach, but he's also been a founder and he deeply understands and empathizes for the founder journey. And whenever we try to give founders all that great advice, that empathy is really, really core. And Ben has that in spades. And so I think you guys are in the treat and we're really, really excited to jump in. The last thing I'll say really fast is uh, this session is so much better if you guys are interactive and communicate with us and really make it your own. And at the end of the day, we're just here to try to make sure that you guys can be the best versions of yourself. And so please raise your questions, raise your hands, ask your questions and make sure you can participate. Yeah, absolutely. And just to second that, uh, you know, probably if you're wondering this question, even if you think it's super, super obvious, there's probably another 10 people in the room that would really benefit from that. Uh, last thing on the intro, I noticed that it lists me as founding partner at Velocity, which is true. Uh, over a decade ago, I founded uh, Velocity Group, and they're a fantastic coaching firm. Um, my my partners there have carried on. I I actually sold off my ownership probably four or five years ago. I've been coaching uh, independently. Uh, if you do want to coach with me, I you know happy to reach out to me at, at Ben at Benjamin Tauber, uh, dot com. Um, but let's let's get into it. So, Xiao, why is creativity so important? We were talking about all the things that we could cover in a session together 
today and we thought this is the one that's really overlooked, right? So what what is it that makes this so important for you as an investor? Yeah, I, I think it has to do with the kind of uh, problems that we're trying to solve. And there's, there's a really good hand raised comment in the Q&A, right? Like, like, obviously, the thing that we should optimize for is removing carbon and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. But unlike a lot of other tasks in the world, there isn't really an obvious way to do this at scale and economically. Um, the metaphor I always think about is the founders in this space are being forced to go into a dark, mysterious forest, a forest that oftentimes people haven't found their way out of. And we're asking folks to really think hard and think about the interesting, novel ways to navigate something that no one else has done before. That, by its nature, is a, a huge requirement for creativity. Yeah, and and so then and then that comes to the to the to the next question, which is. Uh, how do you even look for it as an investor, right? Do you know? Does does this founder have it? Do, does this team have it? How do we even look for that? Yeah, it's it's a super super important attribute that we actively screen for because it, it is the nature of the job. Whether you can build a massive business that also does a lot of good will depend on how creative you can be. And there's a lot of early indications of this that we can find. I think some of the ones that I really look forward to is this like genuine sense of curiosity. Creativity oftentimes exists despite a lot of the rational fear that also surrounds the nature of the job, right? You're, you're constantly running out of money. No one's telling you what to do. Uh, you, know, you, you might only have a couple of shots or a limited time to do all these things. And, and yet in the face of all these challenges, can you respond with genuine curiosity and zeal to go solve interesting problems? Um, and then this is why I love asking founders about the past experiences they've had or give them challenging questions when we chat. And like the, the founders whose eyes light up and really, really get motivated to try to explore and, and genuinely see, hey, I might make them a couple of mistakes, but it's an opportunity to try new things. Those are the ones that typically do well in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that, that I hear you really getting at is in, in, a, in a way is this concept of growth mindset, right? And I don't know uh, how many folks on the line here are, I would normally ask for a show of hands, but uh, familiar uh, with with this concept uh, popularized by Carol Dweck, probably the world's most cited uh, psychologist on the planet over at, over at Stanford. But she came up this with this idea of growth mindset and fixed mindset, right? And fixed mindset, you sort of believe that your intelligence is fixed, right? You've got an IQ at so many points, uh, whereas a growth mindset believes that you can learn and grow and improve. And there's actually ways to to identify that ways to actually cultivate it in in an organization and we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that and uh but but ways to look for it and you pointed to that by asking about past experience and things like that another way that i look for it as i'm evaluating client and whether or not they're they're culturable is uh, do they sort of close the the open loop right if they identify a problem are they willing to look at their role in creating the problem or are they always pointing externally it's right. you know it's th this team member's issue it's that investor's issue everyone else is screwing up i've got the right answer versus that's right maybe maybe we're all playing a role in this and then being being open to sharing what they missed or how they can learn from it and and that sort of thing and it's interesting because we we did a study uh, on growth mindset on 180 founders, uh, the only study that, that's been done this way. Um, and what we saw is paradoxically in the, in the early stages, there was a high correlation between fixed mindset and, and closing rounds of funding and larger amounts because you're in a, when you're in a place of high uncertainty, having that level of confidence that you're right actually is an advantage. Yeah, But then what, what we saw is the data would invert. And then as you got into later rounds of funding, as you got to product market fit and started to get to scale, growth mindset had really high correlation to more total rounds of funding, more dollars raised. And, and if you believe that's, that's correlated to successful outcomes, as probably most of us do, do believe that growth mindset really starts to compound because you, you ha you're confronted with the reality of the markets and the reality of what your tech can do. And if you're unwilling to 
to uh, be curious and change course and and utilize that creative function, right? You're just stuck. Yeah. <laughs> and but, yeah. you have to evolve and learn so many new things as the course of a founder, not only in climate, but just generally. And I, I think what you're talking about, Ben, is just that constant ability to change and improve. And uh, obviously, not surprising to see that that correlates with long-term success. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one question that I have uh, for you, Xiao, is, you know, now that we've talked uh, a, a bit about this, like, how do we, how do we actually uh, optimize for this? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, there, there's an individual level, there, there's an organizational level. I think at, at the highest level, when I'm trying to help my founders, I try to make sure that there's no fear, there's no avoidancy in the kind of conversations we have. And that is like the fertile ground that gives the chance for this growth mindset, for this creativity to take root. And as they figure out how they do it on smaller scales, whether a board level or whether a small working group level, we see a lot of that percolate to the larger organization. And then by the time you have 60 people, 100 people in a Series A or Series B company, you start to feel this humming culture where people are allowed to discuss ideas, allowed to be different, allowed to really work in a capacity where there really is no fear. There's a lot of accountability and people are really, really eager to try new things. And I think that naturally correlates to a lot of strength in the organization. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned, uh, well, actually, let's, let's, we'll start with the organization and then, I, then I actually want to start to unpack some of the, the individual, uh, techniques. So, yeah. so, uh, at an organizational level, right. Um, there's this paradox, right there by definition of being a startup, you are running out of money and absolutely everything is, is urgent, right. And yet one of the things that, that we see, and I don't know if anyone here has read Daniel Kahneman's work, but there was a tremendous, uh, tremendous study that, that he did, you know, on, on behavioral, behavioral economics uh, and sort of this inverse relationship between uh, creativity and reward, right? So uh, he would give people a, a creative task, a creative problem-solving task, and one group he would give them uh, a reward, and it was like more money the faster you you solve this task. And the other group uh, didn't matter. And the more that they rewarded that that first group, the, actually the slower they solved the problem. Yeah, right. And so creating that that space that feels safe and feels spacious, you actually improve your your velocity, right? And so how do how do you work with this this paradox? where it's like yeah we got to get this done tomorrow and how do, and it and it feels spacious so yeah. let's let's unpack that one a little bit yeah it, it's a great point and i think at a high level it's important to also differentiate between moments where you just need to execute and and things like reward driven behavior is really really important because people just need to go a b c d and get to a certain place and then there are yeah. the other things where this creativity and the growth mindset we're talking about is really important sometimes it's okay just to be a bit of a blob that spreads out a little bit and and this is where the leadership of the organization is really important to be able to differentiate in what mode various teams need to be at various moments of the actual startup and then incentivize and create that space in the right way. Yeah. And and to to get even more practical about it, right? It, it can depend on the team, right? I mean, if you have your R&D team, you know, doing skunk works and things like that, you That's might right. structure that very very differently. That's right. then your sales team that's right. where we you know or you know different between early in a sales team versus we're now at scaling and we really need to get the systems in place and this is very much wash rinse repeat and yeah. you can use those best practices there and so this is sort of applying it on a case by case basis right yeah, and, and to get um, a little bit I more specific so important with, yeah and, and to get a little bit more specific with climate even using an example right? sales is really hard in climate Oftentimes you're inventing new products or tools that no one else has ever heard before or in a space that they're completely unfamiliar with. And so where that creativity becomes really important is the ability to create new stories, to, to create new ways to hook into people emotionally so that they actually want to listen to what the hell you're actually trying to sell to them. Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is the other place, as long as we're talking about 
the team and the organization overall. Uh, there was a book uh, that came out this year uh, that that got uh, some acclaim called Cultures of Growth uh, by my my friend Mary Murphy. And Mary was Carol's protege and my partner in the in this uh, study. And so she spent a long time looking at how you can create an organizational mindset that is a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And it's fascinating because you can you literally look at the text on on the website. And, and she built an AI uh, uh, algorithm that would do an analysis and just determine the, the, the mindset right there. And then when she would go in and actually do, do the individual studies, you could just see the results, right? And so you can look at what are you optimizing for in your hiring process? How do you actually reward, right? If you make a mistake, if your teammates make a mistake, what's the result of that? Right, you know, is do you, do you create a, a culture of fear and shame? That's right, That's right? right. It, are people afraid to make mistakes? Yeah, uh, or do you have an an openness? Are we asking what can we learn? What are we taking away from this? Right, how do we actually bring these lessons into the organization and do continuous improvement? Right, and if you're creating that that example by modeling your your willingness to take responsibility when there's a mistake. Hey guys, right? Yeah. I, you know, that was on on my my task list. I didn't get it done. I realized that that I've been overwhelmed and I need to learn how to prioritize better, right? Yeah. You start to model that, you create a safe space for other people to to model that behavior too. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Good. All right, so let's uh let's bring it back, shall uh, to the individual, because it's all well and good at a high level. But if I'm a, a founder, I'm like, okay, great. Why am I in this session? How do I actually apply this tomorrow? How do we? How do I change my day? Yeah, I, I think a, a lot of it is giving yourself some of that compassion to say, hey, maybe I should be a blob. And I, I see some of these cool comments in the Q and A that really recognize this, right? Sometimes when you need to be executing versus when you need to be creative, it's a very, very different mindset. When I was a founder, sometimes when I got overwhelmed at work, I, I used to sneak out a little bit and uh, just watch a movie. And that relaxation and the different mode my brain would in uh, as I go watch like The Lion King or, you know, my, my, my go-to was Pulp Fiction for many years. I, I just rewatched Pulp Fiction <laughs> when, I, when I got stuck at work. And it, 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 there, there, there is a, a definite mode change that enabled me to go back to the work with fresh eyes and a fresh perspective and to say, hey, like I, I, I'm not just a robot trying to get to one brick after another, right? There's a possibility to do some gen genuinely creative inspiration here. Yeah. And so I want to I want to unpack the simple brilliance of this, right? Like go, going and, and watching a movie and it's like, well, what the hell? If I was an investor and I was like, oh, man, yeah. my CEO is running out and he's watching a movie <laughs> in the middle of the day. Is this a good in, investment? But let's so let's talk about some of the brain science behind this. Right. So uh, the brain, the the way it works is is there's a at least in the Kahneman model, there's system one and system two, right? There's the conscious layer of your brain where you can do do math and things like that, and it processes it's something like eight bits a second. It's like incredible. Yep. It's incredibly slow processing, and yet you have this larger part of your mind that does unimaginable parallel processes. Yep. Right. Like if you think about the complex math required to throw a, a baseball you know, to, you know, to home plate, uh, it's an unimaginable calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very expensive computational calculation, yet we can do that most of the time pretty effortlessly. And so we want to actually work on how to develop our, our minds to use this, this, this bigger part and to do that really effectively. Because probably if I were to ask for a show of hands of how many people had a great idea while they were in the shower or on the toilet, Yep. taking a walk or on their bike ride or things like that. So many insights just sort of arrive to us yeah. without us being in this conscious, linear way of thinking. And there's a wonderful book that I that I often recommend to founders called The Art of Learning by Joshua Waitzkin. And so he was a chess prodigy who's gone on to be number one in multiple fields, including applying it to something called Tai Chi Push Hands, which is a, a martial art. And 
what he would talk about, and, and this is one of those things that I would invite everyone to apply, even starting tonight, is he had what he called the most important question, the MIQ. And so what you would do is, let's say you're trying to solve a really hard problem. He would load all of the information for that problem into his brain at the end of the night and then purposefully write down the question that he wanted to have an answer to yeah. in his journal. And then he would stop. He would go take a hard stop, go work out, go to a movie, do yeah. anything different and not think about it again yeah. until the next morning. And the first thing that he would do is wake up and just free write what the answer was. And so the, his rate of breakthroughs started growing up dramatically by doing this, loading the information, loading the, the clear question in your mind, and then going and doing something different. And you could, even, you could do this with small naps. You could do it with yeah. going for a walk. You can go, go to a movie. One of my favorite examples of this is, uh, is a friend of mine. Oddly, we, we grew up together, and he now runs uh, one of the largest companies built over the last five years. And I, I, I can't name his name, but he was, uh, this some years ago, he was uh, uh, an engineer uh, on, on a team that uh, was moving very, very fast. Uh, and he had sort of reached what we call the fuck it point in his career <laughs> where he, he ceased to care what other people thought. And so he's like, yeah, you know, I've started napping at work, uh, but people are, you know, were making fun of me. And I go, well, you know, how much are you, you napping? And he's like, uh, you know, two, two and a half hours. <laughs> I'm like a day. He goes, yeah, a day, two and a half hours a day. And I go, no kidding. And, he, and I'm like, well, how does that work? And so he, without naming the book sort of named exactly this framework he goes i load a problem into my brain i go take a a 20 minute nap and then i wake up and i write the answer yeah. and, and then I, I said well how's that going for you and he goes well you know the whole team was ridiculing me but then after we we looked at the number of problems solved and that was one of their metrics they were looking at a hard problem solved they were wor working at that time uh, in you know early AI, ai space he he said, everyone shut up. He was so far ahead of the rest of his team. And it's not like anyone was, was, a, was slacking off, but he was so far ahead that it wasn't even funny. And so there, this is why I want to talk about metrics like this, because there are these non-obvious things that, that make such a huge difference. Another good friend of mine, you know, one of the top VCs in, in Silicon Valley, uh, we bragged to me years ago about one of his teams where it was like, well, their, their cars are first in the parking lot and they're last out at night. And that co company is not here anymore, you know? And so I, there's so much focus on this metric of time spent and hours spent and the shame that we feel if we take this time away, when the reality is that actually doing the thing that nourishes you in, in other ways, whether that's a walk or a workout yeah, a phone call to your mother or whatever yeah. it is, uh, it can actually accelerate the real business results uh, of your organization. Yeah, I, I love these stories. I like my way of thinking about it isn't as elegant. I I, I call it like pickle juice because um, it, 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 it's it's there, there's something there's something passive that just happens very naturally if we can let go of this anxiety of like I need to consciously be like doing shit right like. If, yeah. you t if you take a cucumber and you, you put it in like salt and vinegar and this delicious brine, right? Like you don't have to do anything. You can just have the confidence that the cucumber is naturally going to soak up in this brine and become very, very delicious for your sandwich later. And the actual tactical craftsmanship of doing this well is what you described, Ben, this like setting up the problem. Right. You 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 take the problem to a certain point, but then rather than letting the frustration or the actual like, oh my God, I get to do A, B, and C now, you can say, Okay, I framed it properly. I really, really understand it. And now I can let it go. I can walk away. I can take a walk or watch a movie or play with my kids for half an hour. And and just have that confidence that all that pickle action is happening in the background. I guarantee you it is. And you're gonna wake up and you're gonna have that delicious brine flavor really seeped into your system. <laughs> I'm obviously hungry and I, I want some breakfast. So if that's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think that I think that's fantastic. And then 
you know, and that's the thing that I also find with so many of my founders is that we're working through all of the stereotypes, right? We're all unique. And so what worked for Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk is not what works for me or you. Yeah. And so part of what we're doing is getting into the understanding ourselves, right? One of, uh, and one of uh, Lower Carbon's founders that I work with, we started talking about this and they realized like, oh, actually the, the technological breakthrough, the science breakthrough that enabled our business yeah. happened when I was taking a walk uh, you know, down, down at the water in Berkeley. Right. I was so stumped and I went yeah. and I, I took this walk and then that's yeah. when that happened. And yeah. so we actually restructured his week so that he had that regular time yeah. in, in the day and it just it accelerated everything. Yeah. And so yeah. if I'm thinking yeah. about all the best performing founders from the portfolio, for example, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of them have these very creative side hobbies right like one of them plays music and, and djs on the side one of them loves gardening and he loves walking around his garden with his barefoot and feeling the moles move underneath his feet right and there, there's so many of these examples which to exact everything that we're talking about gives them that balance between the kinds of work that they need to do to be a successful founder yeah well good and and uh Xiao, should we jump into some q a there's some great let's questions in here that yeah. that built up while we were jabbering away <laughs> yeah let's definitely do it yeah so uh in terms of climate metrics for vcs this is from michael yin here uh there's a number who don't agree that there is what are your thoughts if these questions, I, I can't advocate this as well as you. Uh, we're yeah. supposed to press this so they can go live. Is that is that how it works? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, I just clicked that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, Hi guys, let, let me help you with the Q and A. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Great. <laughs> no problem. Um, yes. So there are plenty of questions. Some of them have been voted. So if that's okay with you, we'll start with the one with the most votes. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, right. So yeah. I'll, I'll read them to you and then Please. you're welcome to, to divide and conquer. Yeah. Um, so, um, in terms of, uh, so I think let, let I'm just going to focus first on the questions related to creativity and then there's yeah. there are things that are more maybe general on the, yeah. uh, on address to like climate investment and the, yeah. on the lower carbon in particular. Um, so one question from Michael Yin was how to truly identify founders with growth mindset. So I think yeah. you, you answered some of that, but uh, if you want to give um, uh, more information, he's asking if you had a relab uh, any reliable, reliable assessment tools uh, that you can use to accurately assess that. Yeah, like in my fantasy, what I would love to do is like to do some kind of exercise with the founders I support. Like let's just take pull-ups as an example, right? Uh, you know, pull-ups are hard. But you, you can see the kind of different attitudes in people when they're confronted with a challenge like that. Some people are like, they're really, really curious. Can I do one pull-up? Can I do another pull-up? Can I try? Other founders can then maybe shy away from that, maybe because of reasons of pride or not wanting to be embarrassed. You know, obviously in most phone calls, you can't actually do a pull-up. But in the course of the conversation, what I'm always asking myself is, what is the kind of question or the experience I want to ask about that is like a pull-up here? And that I can see how the founder reacts to see if there is that kind of genuine curiosity and capacity for creativity that I think would ultimately benefit them as they try to solve this deep, complicated problem. So like, yeah. in, in other words, kind of refusing or accepting obstacles and challenges. That's right. Yeah. And like, you know, it, it, in a lot of like traditional tech interviews, for example, people have these like super obnoxious, like, uh, you know, riddles or like, you know, cutting bars of gold and these brain teasers. I think a lot of the value of those questions asked in an interview back in the day were to really just see how people confronted those kind of situations, whether it's genuine curiosity or almost this kind of like fear response. Hey, ben, do you have any assessment uh, tools? Yeah. Yeah. So there, your there are assessments. Yeah, there are there are assessments. So, that, so I mean, if you really want to get that detail, you you can look at the the questions in books like like uh, Carol Dweck's book Growth Mindset or Mary Murphy's Cultures of, of Growth. We we adapted uh, those questions for the study that that we did. the The simple way to to get down to it as a rough approximation is is how open 
you, whoever, let's say you're hiring for your team or you're interviewing a founder, how open are they to alternative perspectives and exploring yep. those? Right. So, so, um, you know, one of my, my favorite, um, favorite investors uh, who used to be, you know, one of the great entrepreneurs had one of the fastest growing companies in, in um, Y Combinator's history. He, he would always look at, at the conversation between himself and an investor as a ping pong match where you're volleying back and forth. Right. And so uh, an investor will, will throw an idea out. Well, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to deal with, uh, you know, the, the competition that's already so far ahead. Right. And then like, and then can you take that data in, see what's valid about it and, and work with that? Or if they, they throw out a different direction, Hey, have you considered solving it with this other type of material? Right. Uh, or is the founder just solely locked on their one perspective? So that's a way to look at it. Uh, the second thing uh, that I want to mention here, and we, we might come back to this, is that mindset is not fixed and you can define it for, for uh, a culture overall. And you can take someone that might be more fixed mindset in a different culture. They become growth mindset. And so Carol really demonstrated this clearly in her studies on uh, students, I think, over at Harvard. And basically, uh, you know, they did an investing course and they, they, did, they made them identical, identical teacher. But in the, the beginning of uh, Group A, the teacher told them that their results as investors are going to be, de you know, are purely dependent on their willingness to learn and grow. And then in the other course, they said it was purely dependent on your intelligence. And what they saw is in the second group that focused on intelligence, people who did well at the beginning continued to do well, and people who did badly continued to do badly. Whereas in the in the in group A, where they said it was dependent on your ability to learn, everyone improved over the over the course of the the class. And so you can really set this tone for the organization. And as as VCs, this is one of the things that I, I work with a number of VCs. Uh, we talk about creating a growth mindset for their portfolio companies. You know, if for no other reason than you're going to get better returns. I think a lot of founders, and uh, I've seen that uh, across also in a portfolio. Um, I, I, you mentioned earlier that the founders need to learn a whole lot of things, uh, especially yeah. if they come from a very technical background. They have to learn management, they have to learn PR comms, fundraising, all ki all kinds of skills that maybe they're not familiar with, and and uh, they might suffer from kind of imposter syndrome that they're in place, they have this responsibility, but they don't feel actually competent at it, and they feel yeah. embarrassed to mention it or to talk about. The fact that they actually don't know how to do this well. Uh, how do you deal with that? How do you create uh, as invest as an investor, especially for for uh, you or Schwab? How do you create that that kind of comfort that it's okay to not uh, know everything uh, as a founder when you're at the top and you're supposed to know everything, sort of? Yeah, like I think my my answer to this is focused on the relationship that you can engender between people, right? Like. The, the founder investor relationship is oftentimes really, really bad because it's set up in this hierarchical way. It's set up in a way where the founder feels like they're constantly being judged and, and yet also in a position of weakness because, oh my God, I have to ask the investors for money. And if, if I don't get the money, everything will collapse. That's not a great environment to actually get honest, non-avoided, safe conversations. And so we have to really try hard to short circuit that because if I don't really get to that depth to really understand what's truly bothering my founders, I, I can't really, really help them. The analogy I always use is I, I have two young boys and I pick them up from school every single day and we drive home and I ask them like, hey, how was your day? And they always say the same frustrating thing. Uh, no, nothing happened, right? Like, I don't want to talk about it. And I'm like, man, like, obviously something happened. It's because as a father, I have the same relationship with my kids that oftentimes founders have with their investors. It's up to me as their dad to make them feel like I'm not there to judge them, right? This is actually a safe conversation where, hey, if they felt scared or frustrated because they didn't get a math problem or like some bigger kid took away the ball, we can actually talk about some of those things. And I think with time, I've tried to really genre that with my kids and they, they do tell me stuff now, but it's the same kind of dynamic that we have to have with people as well, generally. Mm -hmm. it, and I might build on this. There's one thing that Xiao, you do incredibly well, just exceptionally well, 
is using vulnerability to build rapport and and connection. And you know, you you're so humble, uh, but you share about the mistakes that that you've made. You share about the inner fears that you had, right? I mean, I, I was an engineer and entrepreneur at, as well, right? And I had tremendous imposter syndrome. I just thought, well, I'm I'm too dumb to be here. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And and that's really, you know, what I would say after, you know, well over a decade of coaching founders and two decades of building companies is that, you know, unless you build four or five or six companies, yeah, of course you have no idea what you're you're doing. And right, as as an investor, like investors know that, right? And they're they're also have most of them, or many of them, I should say, have very high EQ. They've met with thousands of people and they're pattern matching and they're looking for authenticity, right? And so if you're trying to put on this face like you know what you're you're doing and you're 23 and you're just out of school, like of course you don't. And that's perfectly fine. But we're investing in the the idea that that you're going to be able to learn and grow really, really fast. And the more that you're open about that, what you don't know, and being curious about how you can learn. I mean, the amount of resources that Xiao has to help each one of you uh, to learn the things that you need to learn, right? to connect to experts who've been there before, great coaches who can help you uh, transform uh, is amazing. So it might as well live a life of honesty. It's a lot easier. (laughs) It's very kind. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. I'd like to bring the conversation up because I see a few questions that are more climate focused. So, so yeah. far you talked about growth mindset, creativity, which you know applies probably to, to every startup and maybe every human yeah. being out there. Uh, do you have examples of particular situations that arose uh, more related to climate tech startups that are typically deep tech, science focused, uh, sometimes founded like PhDs, engineers? Yeah. Um, so, Ashwo, uh, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, this stuff is incredibly, incredibly powerful for climate and really deep tech generally because, well, first off, as you've already alluded to, a lot of the founders come from a very different place than founders in, say, B2B SaaS, right? These are these are world-class academics or PhD students who are making the transition to become CEOs and CTOs. And oftentimes, the the very difficult part of that transition is, is learning how to tell their story, is learning to even explain what is this magical thing that they're working on? And, and now all of a sudden, instead of having this backbone of like bullets and scientific facts and the rigor that comes from a very specific kind of communication, it's it's now necessarily having to be creative to talk to people who are very, very different from you, to, to have that safe space to really explore things like theory of mind and to mess up in front of people many, many times until you get that story right. And that stuff all exists in their previous lives, like having hypotheses and things, but the safety and the courage necessary to have that creativity comes out is something that needs to be trained. The example I always give is stand-up comedy, and people mention drama training in the comments too, which I 100% agree with, right? A, a great comedian will play 10, 20 small clubs and just absolutely shit the bed and bomb with terrible jokes. But at the end of that process, they know the timing, they know the exact way and the cadence and the intonation, they just say every single word, and then they do their massive HBO special. It's the same kind of thing for founders in this kind of space, especially in climate, because this thing that they're talking about might not be anything anyone really even appreciates. Their core customer might be scoffing at the idea of doing something sustainable right now. And so they're, they're struggling to find that hook that really makes the value apparent. And you got to kind of go out there and grind it out and really embrace the creative and also the failure part of that process if you're ever going to be successful. So, so you, it's, it sounds like you're kind of running a series of experiments, which should you appeal are. to scientists, actually. Yes, yes, absolutely true. <laughs> okay, maybe except a theoretical scientist who don't run the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let, let me go down the, in the list of questions, see what, what else is there. So... Um, so there's some question about, uh, I, I think it, it's uh, not exactly gross mindset. It's about creativity applied to uh, your technical solution or your business model. Yep. Um, I think it's more like how, how original and different is, is yeah. really desirable. Uh, yeah. Like how much can you really deviate from, from what VCs are used to yeah. uh, until they become you know, less comfortable? Sure. Sure. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah, like, like first off, I, I, I want to address the larger context of that question. Most VCs are pretty terrible, 
that that's just the nature of the business, right? Like the, the power law applies back and forth. If if ten percent of founders really like you know create billion dollar businesses and can scale things really really large, and and ninety percent don't make it, well then ninety percent of VCs are pretty shit too, and then that's just the reality of the world. So it, it's a waste of time to worry about whether the VC can keep up with you or can appreciate how good your idea is, right? Like that that's that that that's just a non starting mindset to begin with. Right. The, the whole idea is that, you know, great founders who are going to create these world changing solutions, you probably know something most people don't. And, and to bring it back to creativity, if you necessarily want to make a scalable impact that you think is important, well, then you have to find a way to connect with the right people who can appreciate that and to identify, OK, who's going to be worth the time and effort for me to really storytell this to so that they resonate and can support me and make the mission possible. Does, does that kind of make sense? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I might I, I might yeah, add just a, a little bit to that, uh, which is there, there's no yeah, maybe in some sense it's the answer, no answer, but there's no. There's no single right answer to this, yeah. right? There are VCs out there that are very principled first first uh, principles thinkers, right? That will ask ask you know questions like, hey, what do you know? What do you know that other people don't know that makes yeah. you think that this is going to work where where other people don't work? But there's also a lot of lemmings out here, and it, and it's very hard as a VC, right, where there's a seven year gap between making investment and seeing whether that decision was right to be confident, right? <clears throat> and so knowing knowing uh, who your VC is and their level of experience and, and things like that, you, you, you can tailor the pitch to that audience. Uh, but the creativity, you have to be willing to to adapt, right? One of One of my founders, they're in the process of closing their series B right now. And they've been through so many different iterations of what the pitch is. They have the long vision. That long vision hasn't changed, uh, but they went at it through a, um, a, a specific climate angle. Then they went at it through a health angle. It's hard to, I, I'm not going to get into the details of the business, but now they, th what's happened is they, they, they figured out that the market shifted and the, the the path to get them from where they want to be to where they want or where they are to where they want to be is actually through um, all the dollars that are coming into the defense space. And so they're like, we're, we just have to tack the ship and change course. And we're going to go over here uh, for this next round of funding because this is going to close big dollars and we're still going to be able to get back to where we want to go. And so that curiosity and willingness to adapt uh, is really making the difference between the, the company existing and not existing. We're we're in that that difficult time right now, um, and it, and it's really uh, a balance, right? Of do you you know do you stay the course? Do you shift course? And how how to do that creatively? Okay, I'd like to kind of um, uh, following what you said on some of the questions. Um, so we've been talking about the importance of creativity for founders and uh, Shuo, you, you mentioned that uh, probably a lot of VCs uh, are not that good at what they do and, uh, and don't necessarily add a lot of value. How, how is it possible for a founder who doesn't, hasn't met maybe a lot of VCs to recognize uh, which VC might be adding more than, uh, than the, the check they might bring? Uh, is there a way for founders to, uh, like, for example, does it matter that VCs are creative um, and uh, what what kind of signs or questions can, can founders ask to assess whether the VCs really understand, be, are going to be supportive and not uh, behave like a, like a father, but more like a partner? <laughs> right? it's, it's a difficult question. Um, I, I think, first of all, we, we have to understand that it's deeply specific, right? There, there's no good general answer to this because everyone's different. Every founder is going to need a different thing. Uh, they're going to need different kinds of unfair advantages to make whatever they're trying to build successful. And so just like when you're dating or looking for good friends to hang out with, you have to really understand like who you are as an individual and what are the kind of people and organizations that are going to help you succeed. And, and only from a deep understanding of that criteria can you then choose the right kind of investors or angels or other folks that are going to best help make sure that whatever you're working on becomes successful. I think the other thing I'd like to comment on is it's also not necessary that everyone on your cap table is this like magical, like, hey, powerful, like breakthrough walls kind of investor for you. 
right? Sometimes it's perfectly okay to say like, hey, I, I have I have this group. They're going to really, really help me, right? Like um, I'm, I'm working with Ben at SOSV and he does everything for me. Great. And then the rest of it is, well, I, I just need like $5 million to make this happen. And and, and these folks, like they're, they're really, really, they, they believe in what I do, but they're probably just going to give me the money and then walk away for a little bit. That's okay too, right? You, you have to choose this kind of right mix of things that make the most sense for you. Maybe, maybe then the question is, is there any type of investor that really you shouldn't have on your cap <laughs> table? And can you detect that you know, in, the, in the first conversation? I mean, I, I, I think so, right? I think like, the, the way I would describe it is I, I only like to work with comfortable people, people who are deeply comfortable with themselves. Because I, I think one of the unfortunate things that is true is Sometimes investors are deeply uncomfortable with themselves and they see investments or board positions as ways to make themselves feel better or it's like a feather in their cap. Uh, th those, those people are always troublesome because the, the, the flow of value is in the wrong direction. They're looking for the founders or the companies that they invested to make them look good and they'll always be adding things unnecessarily to your plate. Whereas... In, in reality, what they should be doing is trying to make your business more successful. And so anyone who kind of like, you know, steals focus or steals your time for their kind of own benefit, they, they completely misunderstand what is the purpose of the relationship. And, and those are the people I would avoid at all costs. Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, just adding to that, right? Uh, when people tell you who they are, believe them. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's such a small space right? You, you can background check folks. You can see how they've been with other companies. If you see them removing founders from their, their companies and they go, oh, but I would never do that to you. It's just this, right? They're probably going to do it. Right? And, um, and they're probably going to try to remove you at, at some, some point, right? If, if you see that happening, if they've had a history of conflict with, with other, uh, other founders or other investors, you know, just use the, those as red flags and as, as filters. Um, it, it's as simple as that. The, the other thing I would say that's a little bit more complicated is that we, it, as Xiao sort of pointed to, you sort of play out these parent-child relationships, which most people don't want to acknowledge. But uh, like I one founder um, who uh, both Xiao and I know, and uh, his investors looked exactly like his PhD advisor, which looked exactly like his relationship with his father. And so he just kept playing out this drama until he got the message, right? And then the next round of funding, he, he was able to select a different type of investor. But, but the investor that he was intuitively drawn to was one that would be a high conflict investor. Uh, and so you can also notice like, hey, what, what am I drawn into these relationships? Maybe am I even the right person to be identifying this this investor, or maybe I'm the right person to pit, pitch, but then my co-founder is better at pattern matching for uh, for character or things like that. And so you can think about how you set up those systems. And the last thing I would say is the cl the climate the climate of the the venture market matters. I you know we've I've been in this for 20 years. Uh, that's odd to say, uh, but true. And, um, you know, we're at a time right now where it is hard to raise money. And so you're going to just have to bias towards getting those dollars closed. Whereas, you know, had it been 2014, uh, you know, 2018 or something like that, you just have a lot more, more optionality. And so uh, right now it's challenging, but uh, a year from now, it might be different and you'll have more options again. So think about, you know, also if you're taking the money, are you, you know, willing to give a board seat? To this person or just make it invite you know an observer seat or or take less money and find someone else right but get the round done <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a it's a tough market out there for almost every category except uh of course ai that that's uh raising crazy amounts um yeah. uh, Shmo, uh, i think uh, we haven't really talked a lot about uh, lower carbon on your thesis yeah. and uh, what, what you how you guys work so uh th there's a number of questions uh Sure. around that in the Q&A. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you see as the some of the key differences between lower carbon and other, v, other climate VCs? And uh, Hong Hai Song in the Q&A uh, mm -hmm. is asking whether, uh, like particularly in your way to select startups in yep. the due diligence process, 
yeah. what do you look at like the in what way do you look at the team the vision the market yeah. that you think is uh is original to to lower yeah. carbon well obviously we do all these things in the best possible way and, and every other team does it wrong right so i, I definitely <laughs> have to say that of course. um <laughs> it's uh i i think the, the the wonderful thing about the climate tech ecosystem right now is there's a lot of great vcs right and so to my previous point about people needing to choose the teams to work with that best suit them, uh, it gives people a lot of great options, right? I think what, what Lower Carbon is really, really good at is we're really, really good at early stage. We're really good at helping companies build the foundations of the business. And we're really, really good at understanding the different market opportunities that are out there. And it's because we're well connected with a lot of the eventual customers and partners that our portfolio companies want to work with. And we have these deep closed door conversations where it becomes very, very clear to us what is actually necessary to build a sustainable business in this field. And I, I come back to this idea of this sustainable business because our, 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 our overall thesis is that the best way to make climate impact is to actually find ways to give people the things that they want faster, cheaper, better, and more sustainably. We're, we're not talking about like green premiums or like even saving the world that much, right? Like people fundamentally do things for the most reptilian reasons, right? Oh, this is gonna make me a lot more money. Oh, this is gonna be a lot faster. This is gonna be a lot better of a product. And to understand in detail this dynamic means that not only can we choose, I think, the right companies to support that can make the most impact in the shortest amount of time, but then once we agree to partner with the portfolio companies, we can help them as they figure out how to package what they're doing in the most palatable way to a lot of these, honestly, sometimes very slow and conservative businesses that they have mm -hmm. to work with. And maybe an um, additional question is around uh, how you look at regulations, because in climate tech, as you know, there's a number of subsidies, number of regulations that can favor or uh, hinder the the uh, deployment or scaling of technologies. Um, so the IRA was uh, has been uh, very supportive of a number of technologies. There's not a lot of uncertainty regarding the the future of this uh, of this due to uh, the upcoming election. So how how do you look at at regulations and subsidies in climate tech sector in general? Like is yep. that a determining factor for you for investment? It, it can certainly help. Um, you know, we we see these things as an accelerant you have to really understand the core techno-economics and the business model of a lot of these new solutions. And regulation and policy and things like the IRA can add fuel to that fire. Maybe it's possible then to get into market one year early or two years early because of some of these things that are coming from the government side. But we also need to be sure that we understand the limitations of some of these things, right? A, a business that only exists on the back of subsidies that never reach an economic parity, those are things that we're still going to be kind of wary about. And so I, I think the art of it is to understand how exactly this can help the core business while understanding fundamentally what is the attractiveness of the business in itself. In, in the broader picture, right, there's a very, very interesting evolution to how VCs even interact with like government and policy and regulation, right? Like, you know, so much of the B2B SaaS world prided itself on not even having to touch this part. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the need to think about then how to best help our portfolio interact with both government at the local level and the federal level, this is something that's really, really interesting and where a lot of the creativity we see actually comes into play. Okay, I'm I'm also kind of curious about uh, I was curious about your answer because uh, uh, recent so I'm from France and uh, recently the French government decided to stop some subsidies that they were distributing pretty generously to many startups and uh, I saw some VCs post on LinkedIn that a number of companies in their portfolio are just going to close or fire a bunch of people just due to that uh, because the, the 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 stop of the subsidies. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, you know, uh, are, are you running scenarios of, on your portfolio? What might happen if, uh, you know, President A versus President B uh, gets elected and uh, what uh, what kind of uh, measures uh, might, yeah. might need to be taken? It's, 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 it's a great question. I, I think the, the right time to run those scenarios is when we agree to do the partnership originally, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if this was a business that I would be fundamentally afraid uh, of their survival if certain policy decisions changed, it would really make me question 
whether it makes sense as as a fundamental business. Um, you know, and I, I'm not saying that's like a universally right answer. I think this that's just for me. Uh, I, I would be very very cautious to to back startups that had to rely so heavily on some kind of government intervention. Excellent. So yeah. we just uh, like five minutes away before the the closing of this session. So uh, we can take like uh, maybe share a few a few more ideas. Uh, ben, uh, it looks like you, yeah. you want to share something. Well, I. I was just going through the Q&A here, and the most upvoted question is from, and I apologize for pronunciation, Tunin Roy. And he says, hey, guys, this is very general <clears throat> to all startups. Uh, you're going to talk about specific metrics that VCs are looking for uh, with climate startups. And so as maybe we can we can close with that question. I have some thoughts on that. Shall maybe you? No, please. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, well, what I, I was going to use an example of one one of the companies that I was recently coaching, right? And so they're they're really focused on uh, carbon removal, right? And the there's a there's a difference between the metric that you are running the business on and raising uh, that that is the metric that you're reporting on, right? And so so they're at a place where. They're really focused on the unit economics. What is the cost per ton of carbon uh, that that they remove, right? And so they're working on driving the unit e economics to the place where where it is scalable, right? And that's they they know that's what their next round is going to be based on. But that is not even though that's a metric externally they they need internally they were looking at the at the problem solving velocity and that's why i sort of used that example earlier but they they need to solve a number of of scientific r d problems that are both chemical problems and electrical problems and have that team work together and they know that the metric that influences the their external metric is this one and when they started measuring that they realized their velocity was too low there was no way that they were going to get to the next round and so they by measuring this metric and then making changes both in terms of how they they went after solving problems the team organization even shifting the leadership and and focus they were able to iterate and actually get to some breakthroughs that unlocked uh funding against this this metric yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> can, can you say it one more time? Uh, yeah. That was about the climate metrics that oh. uh, you try to, you look for uh, for startups. If there's some specific metrics, I suppose could be related to, you know, potential like a GHG in, uh, reduction impact uh, or some other like a... Some other metrics. Oh. Frankly, I don't know if there's like a one general metric that could be generalized. Yeah. Aside from that one, maybe the redu uh, reduction in the carbon emissions. Uh, but even then, at the well, early just, just to be clear, okay, I, yeah. I think I understand. Like, no, no, no one gives a shit about that stuff, though, right? And and, and th th this is the point that I want to make clear for the audience: no one cares, mm -hmm. right? You mean the, the corporates working with yeah, yeah, yeah. products don't care? No one, no, 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 no one gives a shit, right? P people care about money. So if, if 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 we're talking about real metrics that matter, right? Like the story needs to talk about how this is going to save people money, or earn people more money, or uh, make them more powerful, or enable them to own valuable pieces of civilization uh, in the future. Like th th these are the things that motivate people, right? It, it, it's not going to be you know some some like shishi fufu soft thing about making the world better. Glad we're ending on a high note. On those, yes. words, <laughs> on those words, it's a, 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 a big, a big cup of reality uh, right there. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, I think uh, we're pretty much at time. So I'd like to to thank you all for your time. Also, thanks uh, uh, to our audience for the many questions uh, you posted. I don't know if there's a way to maybe address those uh, maybe later in, uh, in some way, but uh, we'll we'll try to figure it out. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if you want to reach out to uh, Shuo, uh, what's the best way to, to reach out to you? E email is always the best. Email is always the best. And uh, Ben, how about you? Yeah, email. Ben at BenjaminTauber.com would be great. I'd love to, to hear from you. If you have any questions, I'm always, always happy to help. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Excellent. Really so as a reminder... Uh, as a reminder, the session will be available on the replay on the, the SOSV YouTube channel. And we have plenty more sessions coming up this week, as well as some uh, main stage sessions with panels and interviews uh, that you're welcome to join. Uh, for founders and investors, we also have a matchmaking event uh, running uh, this week uh, with 
close to 900 startups and 700 wow. investors. Uh, I think, Shro, you, you joined some of those events before, so you know the scale. Uh, it's free, it's virtual, and it uh, might be where you could find uh, the next deal or the next funding for your company. Uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. There's other sessions coming up. Uh, take a look at the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.